Well, let's get Jared in out here. So why don't we stand up for the reading of the Word today from the book of Galatians. We love to read the Word. We love to stand in honor of the Word of God. Uh, as the passage of Scripture today we'll be reading from is the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 16. And, uh, and just before I read this, I just want to commend Gerald to us. So I, I, um, you know, I, I don't take it lightly for people to be on the platform to minister. Uh, it's, a, it's a place of, um, of particular uh, gifting and skill and calling. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I ask the people that I feel the Lord has placed something on their heart to do that. Uh, it's not any more important than someone who greets at the door. Please understand that. It's not any more important than, than speaking to someone about Jesus in your neighborhood. Uh, please understand that. And so I want you to know that, that even though this is a, a stage, it doesn't mean that it's any more important. It's just a way that some, some people have been called to, to serve the house. And, uh, and I believe, um, you know, like Jackie did a few weeks ago, come and let us uh, so wonderfully. Thank you for doing that, Jackie, uh, leading the service. So I believe that, that Geraldine is a, a young man that has uh, got the Word of God in him. And, uh, and so today I ask that you just keep your ears open, keep your hearts open, uh, encourage him, support him, and, uh, and let the gift of God that's in him flourish today. Amen. And so, uh, and so we, we metaphorically lay hands on him and uh, impart the gift of God in him. So let me read this to you. Galatians 2 verse 16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In Jesus' name we said, Amen. Let's welcome Jared as he comes. Thank you, young man. Looking sharp. Thank you, George. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. We're good? Yeah. Excellent. This is my uh, first time using a lapel, so it's, uh, it's good. It's good to have your hands free and whatnot. You can be seated. Uh, as George said, it, it is the last Sunday of the decade, and what an honor it is to bring us around the Word of God on this last Sunday of the the decade. You know, today we are going to unpack and deconstruct a particular phrase that appears in the scriptures. Uh, and I believe that the de this deconstruction will change how you see life because it may very well ha change how you see God. And because of this change in how you see God, I believe it will subsequently call to the convictions upon which your life wow. is built. And I call to remembrance Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, that says that. You might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, a posture to increase in the knowledge of God allows you to increase your perspective, so much so that you'll begin to see things as God sees them. With that in mind, today we will explore and understand what it means to be a faithful Christian. So as we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, this opportunity to come around the Word, to see truth and apply truth to our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that the truth that is spoken from this platform will resonate in the hearts of those hearers today. As we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. amen. So within the epistles, there exists quite an interesting phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ. Not faith in Jesus Christ, though that does appear, the faith of Jesus. Jesus Christ. In fact, this phrase appears nine times in various forms in the New Testament, and it has no bearing on what I'm about to say, but at least it proves to you that I know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so, um, as I was reading uh, Galatians 2.16, which was read just a moment ago, I came across an interesting yet subtle observation. And though the observation is indeed subtle uh, and somewhat technical, it has profound implications, especially on how Christians approach the topic of applying faith. Galatians 2.16, if we put it up on the screen, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Here we see the phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ and believed in Jesus Christ in the same verse. In fact, in this one verse, we see that there is an explicit delineation between the two phrases. So at base level, at the very least, we know there is a difference between in and of. And the question now is, what is the difference? 
Now, please note for the purposes of this message, I will be using faith, in, uh, I'll be using faith of Jesus and the faith of God interchangeably, but effectively they call back to the same concept. And you'll see what concept that is in a moment. So the pertinent question at this point is, what is the difference between faith in God and the faith of God? Am I really making a big fuss over nothing? Am I just getting caught, caught up in the lexical semantics, as it were? I have to look that up on Google, it's a thing. All right, the difference, simply put, faith in God speaks to what we do, but the faith of God speaks to who He is. It describes the nature of the entity that we are placing our faith in, which we find in Scripture is actually a personal triune being. The faith of Jesus Christ means that regardless of whether or not you decide to place your faith in Jesus, in God, God still remains faithful. In other words, his faithfulness is not contingent or dependent on whether you think he's faithful or not. Your opinion doesn't change the fact that he is. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Commentaries on that verse put it this way. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. That is to say that faithfulness is an innate characteristic of God. Hence, he cannot deny being faithful even when you yourself are not. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God, note, faith of God, without effect? Verse 4 says, God forbid. This is just two of many verses that explicitly state and affirm the steadfast, faithful nature of our God. Consider these other scriptures, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, which keeps His covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful by, by whom you are called unto the fellowship, the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God's faithfulness. How about this famous one in 1 John? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God is faithful, church. His very essence is faithfulness. For God to say that he isn't faithful, as we've seen, is to deny, is to deny himself, which we've seen he cannot do. And what is truly profound is that as we draw nearer and closer to Him, we realize, thankfully, that His faithfulness is not dependent on you. And tethered to this idea is His goodness, His graciousness, His love, His justice, His power also remains at His disposal regardless of what your internal posture is towards Him. Before we break this down even further, it is important to note that both faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus signify two very important concepts that will facilitate God's hand on your life. I don't want to take any, anything away from placing faith in God, but of equal importance is understanding God's faithful nature. What we do and who He is are very important. Yeah. Why? Because you, as a person who is responsible for your own decisions and actions, need to know, and I stress need to know, if you are, pl- if you are applying your faith into something that is, in fact, faithful. You need to know if you are applying your faith into something that is, in fact, faithful. Now, the reason why I stress this, uh, this imperative to need to know is that there exists a requirement of applying faith whereby the believer must not doubt in his heart. You must not doubt in, in your heart. If you've placed faith into something that isn't faithful, there is already doubt from stage one. Now, here's an example. I can have faith in an apple to turn into an orange, but it won't because it's not part of its nature to do so. However, I can have faith in an apple to produce seeds because it's part of its nature to produce seeds after its own kind. Likewise, I can have faith in God to be faithful, and I will see his faithfulness 
because it's part of his nature yeah, to be very faithful. Good, very good. Do you, some of you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, come on. You may then question, why should I pray and expect my bank account to increase in funds or pray that a disease or ailment will vanish from a body when it's not part of its nature to do so? And that is a very good question because it means you're beginning to realize that faith is not wishful thinking. Yeah. God is not your genie. And that as Christians, it's never about having faith for something. It's about having faith in someone who is purely faithful. So the pertinent question is, why do I need to place faith in something if faithfulness is already part of its nature? If I claim that God is faithful, what's the point? What's the use of me applying faith? Why do I have to place faith in God when, you, when I claim that God is already faithful? What's the use? Doesn't seem redundant. The question itself stems from a misunderstanding of what faith actually is. You know, I once saw a photo online that said uh, that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith is spelled risk. Faith is not a risk. Faith eliminates risk in the believer's heart. Faith is not even hope. Faith is not even hope. The Bible says that faith is evidence. It's evidence. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yeah. not seen. Yeah. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not hope. It's the, it's the substance yes. of things hoped for, the evidence of things yes. not seen. So if faith is evidence, it must be reasonable. <laughs> faith, faith is reasonable. But because we have thought that faith must involve a gloomy sense of the unknown, we have dismissed it as a unreasonable and unable to be understood. We've put it into the spiritual, ethereal, unreachable realm of things. We have to stop segregating spiritual things from the everyday. Faith is every day. To make this easier to understand, consider this. You are applying faith right now. Right now in this very moment. You're applying faith in the integrity of the chair you're sitting on. Some of you guys have to uh, apply a little bit more faith than others, uh, looking around, but uh, moving on. You still have to make a decision whether or not it be conscious or subconscious to trust that the chair will support your weight. You're putting faith in the chair to support your weight. Your willingness to sit in the chair is actually a manifestation of your faith in the, in the chair to fulfill its designed purpose, its nature. So what does this prove? It proves that you use faith in your life more than you realize, much more than you realize. Every time you jump into a car, you have faith that the car is going to work and keep you safe. Every time you jump onto an airplane, you have faith in the pilots to do their job and get you to, their, to your destination. Every time you text message, you have faith in the cellular <laughs> network to deliver your text messages, emojis, and GIFs. GIFs or GIFs? Uh, GIFs. GIFs. All right. GIFs. GIFs. That's a different one. If we use faith this much, it means that we shouldn't be so shocked to apply some faith into something that is purely faithful, a.k.a. the faithfulness or the faith of God. So what do I mean by pure faith? The attributes of God are actually known as the perfections of God. His attributes are known as perfections of God. Now, they are known as the perfections because God is 100% of every attribute that he has. The various attributes or perfections of God are not component parts of God. God is 100% love and 100% just. Each attribute or perfection describes his total being. What that means is that God shows what, sorry, what that means is that when God shows his love, he doesn't abandon his justice, and when God displays his justice, he doesn't abandon his love. He is 100% justice, 100% love every day, all day. He shows love in his justice and justice in his love. And he does that for every single perfection that he has. So every day we place faith into so many things around us. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it make sense that we place faith into God who is purely 100% faith? Now, the second thing we need to learn from this example of you sitting in a, in a chair is that you don't need to have an unknown element in order to apply faith. The plain evidence of something's nature can contribute to the faith process. The plain evidence of something, something's nature can contribute to the faith process. Like I said, faith is reasonable. 
You applied faith into the chair because you know it's part of its nature to support a certain amount of weight. Now, this point, just to go off a little bit on on a tangent, this point is important because it's the reason why many people reject the use of modern medicine. They think that the use of medicine is a lack of faith, and they think that medicine is too straightforward in order for it to be God-ordained. This is a direct result of the incorrect belief that faith involves a risk. Faith is not a risk, church. And please understand that I'm not saying that all medicine is good for you, but the medical profession is a provision and a blessing from God. And I understand that there are some unique and specific cases where individuals have heard from God directly to abstain from using medicine and they have acted on that conviction. But don't automatically assume that the use of medicine is a lack of faith. Generally speaking, believe it or not, it's actually closer to tempting the Lord your God than anything else. <laughs> it's closer to tempting the Lord your God than anything else. And I'm not going to go into it, but if you reread uh, the temptation of Jesus and you insert a metaphor of using uh, medicine, modern medicine, you'll see what I'm talking about. But you can look at that in your own time. So to answer the original question, why do I need to place faith in something, that, in something if faithfulness is already part of its nature? Why do I need to place faith in God if God is faithful? And here's the answer. Your faith in something, allows you to experience the nature of the object you are placing your faith in. The comfort of the chair or the car. What was that? that All right, I'll say it again. (laughs) Rewind. Your faith in something allows you to experience the nature of the object you are placing your faith in. The comfort of of the chair or the car or the services of the plane in text messaging allows you to experience those things. Faith in God allows you to experience the faith of God and allows you to experience his faithful nature. Now let's see how Jesus did it. Like I said earlier, an understanding of the faith of God has profound implications, especially on how Christians approach the topic of applying faith. So let's see how Jesus did it and uh, use a case of healing to further grasp this concept. Prayer for healing is what Christians are meant to do. But I believe that there is a right way of doing it. And thankfully, I believe Jesus modeled for us what it should look like. Mark 23, verse 21 to 24 says, And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, or truly I say unto you, that whatsoever... uh, that whatsoever shall say, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. This is how Jesus did it. And so let me give you two scenarios, where the premise is that you have a loved one who has some health complications. Now, the first scenario is about an objective where your faith is postured towards the manifestation of a healing. It's about the manifestation of healing. In my observation, this is how Christians, most Christians, apply faith. They apply faith for something. Now, you can, in this scenario, you start off with the health complications. Then you pray for healing, but what happens, or what can happen, is you focus on the, on the problem because there are no safeguards for your mind to wonder. You can, be, you can begin to focus on the problem rather than the solution because the object of your prayer is a result rather than on the character of God. This results in endless prayers, frustration. It can actually result in a lack of faith or discouragement because you're not seeing the completion of your prayers. It can actually result in potential bitterness because you may not see the result you were hoping for. Your faith was only geared to a result and not to a person. Now, if we look at verses 23 and 24 of Mark chapter 11, it may look like it supports this first scenario. But but verse 22 says this, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Before we ever get to verse 23 or 24, we must first consider verse 22. Have faith in God. It starts with faith in someone not something. And what's interesting to me is that when I researched this verse, I found that the original translators into English 
have actually made a footnote in most margins of the Bible for verse 22. And they say that an adequate rendering of faith in God can actually be the faith of God. It is so close and so subtle that they actually decided to put a footnote that says this can also be rendered as faith as the faith of God. So what they're saying is it could have easily been translated into have faith in the faithfulness of God. Wow. Then verse 23 yeah. and verse 24 come after that. And that's really the message today. If you need to remember one thing, church, it's to have faith in the faithfulness yeah, of God. So what Jesus is saying in the context of this passage is having the knowledge of the faithfulness of God, you can say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And this leads on to scenario number two, where the objective is resting in God's nature and his character, what the Bible calls the faith of God. Again, we start off with the same premise. You may have a loved one with health complications and you pray a prayer of faith in God's nature. God's nature is faithfulness. God is faithful to his word and his word proclaims that he is the Lord that heals us. Healing results. We only need to place our faith in God's nature. His nature itself will ensure that his word does not return void, which is why the word of God is important and powerful. And what we know, what, what this, what this uh, summarizes for us is that your prayer is never necessarily for healing, for finances, for safety, but rather a prayer to rest and to activate, to minister the nature of God, His presence into a situation. The presence of God is, a pow- is, is very, very powerful because it carries God's nature with it. That's why His presence is transformative and has the ability to change lives, hearts, and minds. But do you see the difference that occurs when we activate the faith of God into a situation. We allow God to be God and remove our own infallible nature from the equation. What Mark 11 shows us is that effective and faithful prayer is about praying with specific details and placing our expectation in God first and who He is. It's not necessarily about how hard we pray. Now, in this process that I've just outlined for you, it's important to not discount the role that the Word of God has to play. It actually starts with the Word of God, all of it. Take, for example, Exodus chapter 15, where it says, I am the Lord that heals you. This inspires us to have faith in God. And that we know that God is faithful, as, as it's part of His character, and His faithful nature ensures that His Word does not return void. It starts with the Word, and He ensures that His Word does not return void. Yeah. It starts with the Word, it finishes with the Word. And isn't that why the Scriptures tell us that Jesus, the Word made flesh, is the author and the finisher of your faith? The only reason why you place faith in God in the first instance is because the Word of God tells you that it's actually worth your while. It's a continuous, perpetual cycle where you lean on God's Word and by His very nature, God will perform perform it as it, ex- as it says in Ezekiel 12, for I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. This is why it's so important to be familiar with the scriptures. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this is what we see here. Word initiates Faith. His own, God's own faithfulness validates his word. So because of that, when the word of God says that I am the Lord that heals you, he does because he's faithful. When the word of God says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, it's true because he is faithful. When the word of God says that you are the righteousness of God, you are because he is faithful. The word of God inspires us to believe for certain things. The word of God inspires us to believe for certain things. He places the desires into our heart as we are willing to delight ourselves in Him. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, I used to think that meant uh, if I delight myself in the Lord, I'll desire a jet ski, uh, and I'll get a jet ski. That's not actually what it says. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, And he will give you what you desire. He will place desires into your heart. I'm still waiting for that desire to be a jet ski, but uh, (laughs) check check every day. Um, 
Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires that are placed in your heart. Now, if we call back to the last verse, um, Mark 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Again, we've thought in our, our Christian walk that when we apply faith to something, it's whatever I desire, we can, we can claim. Right? No. Whatever things, so what things soever you desire, in tandem with Psalm chapter 37, where God places a desire in your heart, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Are your desires God ordained this morning, church? Today, as I begin to close, today we talked about just one of the perfections of God's nature. Just one perfection. But there are so many more aspects of his nature that we can rely on that will allow us to rest and operate in him on an entirely different level. See, when you place faith in God, you are placing faith in more than just his faithfulness. When you place faith in God, you are placing more, you're placing faith in more than just his faithfulness. His eternality and immutability, you're placing faith in that. This gives us confidence that God has never, nor will he ever cease to exist. And if he himself cannot fail, neither does his promises. We place, when we place faith in God, we place faith in his omnipresence. He is our ever-present help in time of trouble. Though you may not feel the immediacy of his presence 24 hours of the day, that doesn't change the fact that he is there 100% of the time. When When we place faith in God, we place faith in his love. He is 100% love, which means that God seeks good for the object being loved. And guess what? Today and forevermore, you are the object of his affection and his love. Yes. Yes. Let me finish with these four things. Being a faithful Christian church means having faith in the faithfulness of God. Being a faithful Christian means having faith in the faithfulness of God. Faith is not about a result or an outcome. Faith is about an experience, a relationship. I challenge you today to intentionally learn about the God that you serve, who he is. What is he like? Because knowing God Seeking Jesus personally will dramatically determine how you live this life. Now, if you thought this message was about faith, I can forgive you for that because I've I've said faith uh, probably 600 times this morning. But this faith, uh, but this message really isn't about faith. This message is about knowing God and knowing Him deeply. This message is about knowing God and knowing Him deeply. And with that in mind, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that was brought this morning. Lord, help us understand a new level of your faithful nature. Help us to understand who you are in our every day. Help us to know that you are a faithful God. And help us to realize that we never should have faith in something, but we should have faith in someone. And church, as we go into a new decade... Let us be reminded during this decade that it's never about faith for something. It is about faith in someone. Yes, Lord. It is about him, and that's always been about him. Yes. And through God's faithfulness, Lord, we experience all your other perfections. Help us to realize this in the everyday. This we pray in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Yes, and church, with our eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're here in this place and you're listening to how I'm talking about Jesus, this person, how he's 100% love, but he's also 100% justice, and he's, and he's faithful, and you don't know Jesus here this morning. You have an opportunity right now to give your life to Jesus, yeah. to dedicate your life to something greater, something eternal. 
The Bible says that the law of God is written on every human heart. And you may think to yourself, I can't become what I'm talking about. I can't become that close to God because of what I've done. But like I said in the sermon, God is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. So if that's you this morning, with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you this morning, just raise your hand. If you, today you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, to follow a faithful God, a loving God, a just God. I'll give you just one more moment. You can just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Church, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the new souls here today that have dedicated their life to God, have re-evaluated who you are in their life. You are the faithful God. You are the good God. You are the loving God. Lord, I pray that those lives that have rededicated or dedicated for the first time, well, they would continue to live the rest of their life with an understanding of who you are from this day forward. As we pray in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen.